Well, brethren, let's uh, turn again to the to the Gospel of Mark in chapter ten. Mark chapter ten. <clears throat> when my kids were little, <clears throat> they used to say, "Dad, you preach so long in books of the Bible that my Bible wears out and the pages fall out." Well, I suppose that's pretty true. We've been fifty sermons in the Gospel of Mark so far. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about when we visit is whether or not we need a change of, uh, of diet for a little while as well. So we'll talk about that. But now let's read in the Gospel of Mark and uh, chapter 10, verse 17 through 22. <clears throat> now, and when he, that's Jesus, was gone forth out of the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honour thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. And Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And, uh, we leave the reading at that point. <clears throat> The, uh, the section actually goes on, follows on quite naturally right down to verse 27, but we'll leave it at that point this morning because uh, we'll have two sermons on this portion of the Word of God and we'll take that second section up next week, God willing. Uh, brethren, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing uh, if you ever thought to yourself how wonderful it would be uh, to be in a situation where the Lord Jesus was visiting our town and he came to, to speak to us in a gathering uh, so that we could actually hear his voice and sit at his feet and, uh, and, and hear the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But I, I wonder whether we'd feel as though it was so wonderful if he said to us, okay, sell all that you have, take up your cross and follow me. That, that, might, that might challenge us just a little bit, mightn't it? At a level that we're not used to being challenged, we think to ourselves, well, maybe that's not quite reasonable. I don't think there, there was ever a teacher more challenging and more searching in his ministry than the Lord Jesus Christ. He, go, he gets straight to the heart of the matter and uh, he stays there. And it would have, I think, have been very, very disconcerting uh, for almost every human being uh, that sat at his feet. But here, here in this uh, section of the Word of God, uh, we've got a beautiful example of how the Lord Jesus Christ deals wisely and, and pastorally like a shepherd with his sheep, uh, with each individual that comes. Uh, he's, he's got, a, he's got a, uh, a particular application of the doctrines and truth of grace to each individual with their need. He doesn't have a big broad brush that just paints with a, a broad stroke over everything and everyone. He deals with individuals and very graciously and wisely. And uh, this is one of those examples because here the Lord Jesus is met by a young man. And as is described throughout the scripture, this young man is, is what I would describe as a, as a very notable up and coming uh, leader in the religious world and and wealthy. Uh, he's often described as the rich young ruler. Uh, 
Well, he was certainly wealthy, as we as we learn later. Uh, he, he was grieved because he had great possession. But he was also a very religious man and a very sincere chap. There was no question about the sincerity of, of all that he was saying and all that he was doing. And the Lord Jesus deals with him as such, and he deals wisely and graciously. And what the Lord Jesus says to him has, has the most far-reaching and, uh, and soul-searching application for us all as we reflect upon it. So let's look at it this morning. Uh, the young man comes to the Lord Jesus and he says, what shall I do? And uh, I've got it in my Bible uh, highlighted and underlined that little question. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So he's got his eye on salvation and he wants to know what he can do to obtain that salvation. So uh, I take from that this theme. Jesus and sincere do doism. So do doism, a way of religion. It's Jesus and people who are sincerely trying to do something to get into the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to call it do doism. We'll see three things that there's a sincere question, there's a searching response, and there is a sobered soul. So the first thing will be our sincere question. What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Uh, I've got to tell you, brethren, when, when I read that, and still when I look at it, I think to myself, how wonderful it would be if people we met asked that question. In our day and age, we, we sadly are always laboring to provoke some measure of interest in spiritual and eternal things. But here's a man who comes to the Lord Jesus, falls down before him and asks this sincere question, what must I do to be saved? In our day, we're trying to provoke some interest. We hold forth the Lord Jesus in all his grace and glory to the best of our ability so that people can see what a wonderful saviour he is. We press the demands of the law and, and show, show guilt and judgment to come. Still nothing. We even show something of the horror of hell and the joy of heaven. But it seems almost to no avail. It's like as if we're preaching to the wind. What a joy it would be to have earnest inquirers coming into uh, the, the, the midst of the church, into our homes and, and to the office of the pastor and, and, and with a question like this, how we would rejoice. But there was a bit of a problem with this question. And uh, we would need to be wise and to learn from the Lord Jesus if we were to deal well with the question. Because the question actually reveals something that is amiss in this young man's uh, religious principles, the way he's thinking about salvation. He comes to the Lord Jesus and he, and he talks about inheriting. Uh, he knew as a young Jewish man that God had promised his saints an inheritance of eternal life and glory. But he's thinking of that inheritance of life and glory as something to be earned. What must I do? Yes, in his mind, it's an inheritance. It's, it's, it's a wonderful gift of God. But the terms, as it were, of the will by which the inheritance is made over runs like this. It's as if God says to people, I bequeath eternal life and glory to you just so long as you do what is required to make yourself worthy. That's the idea. It's interesting that uh, John Calvin years ago when he was dying had a son who was very irreligious and he put a clause in his will that said only if the boy was 
converted and repented could he ever inherit any of uh, the wealth of his father. Always surprised me that John Calvin did that. But that's the sort of uh, that's the sort of will this young fellow uh, imagined that God had. I'll, I will give you eternal life just so long as you do what makes you worthy of. And so he comes with the question: What must I do to inherit eternal life? And that throws up the question. If we stop for a moment and think, that throws up the question: How does a human being fallen? in sin, in Adam, how does a fallen human being become worthy of eternal life? How, how does a, a fallen hu human being become righteous, right with God, acceptable to God, and a person who can be rewarded with eternal life? How is that possible? How does it, it happen? Well, brethren, there's only two ways. And this goes to the, co to the core of what this young man's talking about. There's only two ways you can be right with God and worthy of eternal life. The first way is by doing what the law requires, or that's the way we imagine it will work. Now, as Presbyterians, or those who are sort of getting used to the Presbyterian church and to our way of thinking and, and sort of constructing things uh, as we gather up the Word of God, that, that's what we know as the covenant of works. And under the covenant of works, uh, the idea is that my works done in obedience to God's law earn and merit and make me worthy. And because that harks right back to the beginning when God had created man in the Garden of Eden and he said to Adam, in the way of obedience you'll live and inherit, but should you disobey, you'll die. And so that, that adds up to righteousness comes by my doing the things that the law requires. See that? If I do what the law requires, I'm righteous. And if I'm righteous, then I'm worthy and I may inherit eternal life because that's the construct that was there in the beginning. And uh, that's the first way. That is, in the essence, of the religion that was living in this young man's heart. What, what must I do? But there's another way, and this is God's way. And it's the way of the covenant of grace. Not works, grace. And this covenant runs in this way. Christ fulfills the law in my place and on my account. And then his obedience, his righteousness is given as a free gift to me. And that is the basis upon which I can inherit eternal life. It's a completely different basis. One is my works. The other is his works. You see the difference? It's a huge difference. There's a difference between life and death. There's a difference between heaven and hell. It's the difference between God giving heaven to someone who's good enough or God giving heaven to someone who is not good enough but has received eternal life as a free gift through Jesus Christ. That's the difference. One's by works, one's by grace. Now, because the law and that construct of if I do, I can live and, re and be rewarded is so deeply etched into our human psyche as a religious principle because that's what we are as human beings. We, we, we visualize ourselves in relation to God and we, we think to ourselves, if I do good, God will reward me and if I do bad God will punish me therefore I better do good and the better I do the more I'll be rewarded and if I can just do enough what can I do to inherit eternal life but it's etched into our souls and I think brethren uh, you know that's true because that's sort of the default switch that clicks in our mind every time 
uh, we realize we, we're out of order with God. We think to ourselves, ah, I've done wrong. I better, I better put that right. I better, I better do better. I, I've got to try hard. I've got to try hard. I've got to, try, I've got to do. That's our default religion. What do I have to do to save myself? My religion, my religion, by nature, is do do. I've got this sort of quirky thing in my head. I think it's a dog when I'm talking about dog. It's a religion. It's just do do. It's my doing, and it's like do do. It's rubbish. It won't work. So anyway, this young man comes and he says, what shall I do? He, and he's, he's sincere about this. He's got his eye on the requirements of the law. And the Lord Jesus makes that perfectly clear in verse 19 where he says, you know the commandments. You're going to talk about, you know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud, not honor your father and mother. You know the law. And the young man responds, of course, he says, oh, Lord, his eyes light up and he thinks to himself, wonderful, I've got this covered. I've done all this from my youth. So that's a problem. That's a real problem. This upright, wealthy, young religious man, part of the church, uh, is relating to God through his own works. And the only thing that's going to help him is that he comes to see that he can't do what he imagined he was doing. Somehow or other, he's got to get off himself and his natural do-do religion, and he's, and he's got to get on to the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of do-do for me, he's got to be what has he done? Done for me. He's got to get off earning. He's got to come to see himself as a sinner and needs to be saved by grace, contrary to what he deserves. How's that going to happen? How in the world could that be brought to pass in, in a person's life who's had his, he's grown up this way? It's his religion. It's what he's been doing all his life. Well, the Lord Jesus goes to work on him. And this is a wonderful thing. Uh, the Lord Jesus got a very searching response to this sincere question. And uh, it's got a few steps in it, this response of our Lord Jesus. And uh, we can follow it down yeah, so a little bit. And the first step uh, which we have here uh, okay. is, is where the Lord Jesus says to him, taking him up in a nitpicky manner about his words in verse 18, he says, why callest thou me good? See that? How do you feel like about that? You, you've come to someone in perfect sincerity and you've fallen down and you've said to them, good master, what must I do to be saved? And, and, and the Lord turns to you and he says, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. What, what's Jesus doing? Why, why does he do that? Well, he's not being nitpicky. He's not just being pedantic. He's not just taking people up on their words unnecessarily. Uh, no, what, what the Lord Jesus is doing here is he's going to, he's going to address this question about who is good because the man has come to him and, and is not viewing the Lord Jesus as God become flesh. He's just viewing the Lord Jesus as an ordinary man. Yes, certainly a, a special, specially gifted and authoritative teacher, but just a man. And he looks at Jesus through his own viewpoint as a man and he says to him, Good master. Now that's what Jesus is taking. So you think I, as an ordinary man in your estimation, can be good? And here we gather up around this ordinary man who's good, all the other men who are good, and this young man who sees himself as good. And he's got himself standing with the Lord Jesus, 
and, and Jesus is good as a man, and I'm good as a man, a good master. This is, this is not nitpicky. This is fundamental. Are you good? That's the question. And so the Lord Jesus confronts that. And he says, there is none good but one. Who? Well, that is God. Now, wow, well, that, that, that is sort of like, like addressing the issue that troubles this man and, and is like a barrier to his being saved. It's like addressing it from the, from the very foundations. The Lord Jesus Christ has gone to work on the foundation of this. The man thinks, I'm good. And Jesus is in effect saying to him, sorry. No, you're not. There's no one good but one. And that's God. <laughs> so a couple of things about that. The first thing is this. That when the Lord Jesus points out to him that God is good, he's actually pointing to something that's very important for us to, to learn. And that is that the God with whom we have to do is perfectly and exclusively good. Now, when you think of goodness, what do you think about? Well, someone who's, who's nice and kind and gentle? Is that the idea that sort of pops up in mind? Well, that, that's not actually the biblical idea of goodness. If you follow through the scriptures and you, and you look at goodness, and we haven't got time to do it this morning, you can do some research. But if you follow through on goodness, you'll find that goodness is a little bit like the most fundamental catch-all attribute of God. And God's goodness is the outworking in all of his will and his, his action of his perfect holiness. And holiness is moral spiritual, ethical purity. So that God in his own being is completely separated from and apart from everything that's morally corrupt, everything that is in any way ethically twisted or distorted. Uh, God is perfect ethical purity in the whole of his being, in all his will and all his actions. God is good and does good. And there's no one like him. And that holiness, which manifests itself as goodness, is, is, that, is that out of which not only God's good dealings and, and grace and mercy rise, but it, it's, it's, it's that out of which God's justice rises. God is so good, so morally, ethically pure, in all his self, in all his will and all his action, that God cannot and will not ever wink at sin and act as if it doesn't matter. And, and, if, and if God ever let sin just slide past without it being judged, he would no longer be good. So now we've got a standard that's absolute absolute, infinite, eternal, unchangeable perfection of holiness manifesting yourself as goodness and never letting anything but goodness slide past unjudged. And all of a sudden, this young man has been introduced to a God that he's never really thought about before, not in this way. And there's none good. You remember what we read in Romans 3, verse 10 and 11? There's none good, Paul summed up, no, not one. And so the Lord Jesus is saying to this man, I'm, I'm sorry, you're mistaken. There is no mere man that is good. No man, no woman, no boy, no girl. In other words, you may consider yourself to be good by your standard of judgment, but in fact, you need a different standard of judgment. 
And that's a very sobering truth. To, to be brought to realize that we are not good is, is, a, is a very confronting reality. It's not something that we will ever receive or accept uh, comfortably, and not unless we convert it. It actually makes us so that we have to say to ourselves, I see that I am a sinner among other sinners. And uh, when the Lord Jesus brings someone to that particular point, he's showing them also by implication, and we must not miss this, he's showing them the impossibility of gaining salvation through the good works that they do. You can never be good enough, and the works you produce are not good, and therefore it is absolutely impossible for you ever to inherit eternal life on the basis of what you do. Follow that? No amount of law keeping by a person who's not good. No amount of performing religious rituals. No amount of good works will free us from the defilement of our sin or earn our way into heaven. And I can't even begin to deal with the guilt and the payment that our sin has done. So that's the first step. No. Things have to be changed. We're not good. We're bad. God's good. And we're not. And now we've got to relate to him through that awesome reality that we've come to know. Well, that's the first step. Now, there's a second step. And you see it in verses 19 through 20. Jesus says to him, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honour thy father and thy mother. And the man responds, Master, all these I've observed from my youth. Now, what's going on here? Well, this is what I'd call the second step of uh, his uh, demolishing this young man's mistaken notions. Here the Lord Jesus really goes to work on him. And it's interesting that here in Mark's account and also in Luke, it's recorded as Jesus saying, what says the law? But Matthew has a little more about that in his account. He, Matthew shows that the Lord Jesus also said, if you will enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. Now, isn't that interesting? Is the Lord Jesus Christ saying, do you think, that this young man ought to set himself to work harder? Is he saying to him that if he really just got over the hump, that he would get good? Though he'd be bad, he'd get good, and though he'd be not good enough, he'd get better? Is that what he's saying? Well, no, brethren, that's not what he's saying. The Lord Jesus, rather, is dealing with this man in such a way that he's, he's really saying to him, well, very well. If, if that's the religion that you would seek to live by, let's see where it leads you. Seeing you're wedded to this way of salvation and your own works of the law, let's follow this through. And let's see where you end up. So what says the law? Go keep the commandments. Give it your best shot. See if you can keep them perfectly. See if you can inherit in your own works. So the Lord Jesus is putting him to it and he's going to show him that in this way that he has chosen, there can be no success. And he's going to teach him in such a way that he learns it by experience. That's so important. What Jesus is, is going to teach him, he needs to learn for himself. He's got to be learned in his own heart and his own experience. He's got to know by experientially that he has fallen short and he can't keep the law. And therefore he can't be saved by doing that. He's got to let go of the law and take hold of the gospel. 
You can see, by the way, that same approach used by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul in places like Galatians 3, verses 9 through 14, and Romans 2, 13 and 10, verse 5. But this young man responds, I've kept the law from my youth, from when I was a little kid till now. Now, how could he say that? Well, he could say that because of his view of the law. He saw the law as a rule for his outward conduct. Now, please catch this. He saw the law of God as a rule for outward conduct. And the keeping of the law to a Jewish man meant performing all the duties of the Ten Commandments as they were expanded out and applied into life by the rabbis in the Talmud. And they were all external rules and laws. If you kept them, you were righteous, and if you didn't, you weren't. It's very, it's, it's very external. He didn't imagine that the law of God required far, far more than outward conformity. And that's where he went wrong. Now, that's something worth thinking about just for a moment. Just think of your own life and the way we go about it. I'll think of mine. With our own ideas and our notions about what it means, what the law means and what it demands, we, we tend to bind the law up and restrain it. Uh, the, the law is, is, is a mighty lion and it tears everything that's imperfect to pieces, but we draw its teeth and we try to tame it. We chain the law up so it can't get too close to us. So it has to speak to us, as it were, from a distance. So we can only address our outward conduct. That, that's what we tend to do. And we imagine that when we have reordered our outward conduct, changed our actions to avoid obvious breaches of the law, that we've fulfilled it. And that makes us pretty confident. Yes, I've kept the law. Yes, I can do this. I've kept it from my youth up. I, I, I have never murdered. I've never committed adultery. I, I've never cursed mum and dad. I've never done those things. I've kept the law. But is that right? That's the question. Is that right? And this is what Jesus is going to work on. Is that right, the, the way we think? Or is the law spiritual? Does the law just deal with external or does the law pursue us into the depths of our heart and, and, and demand internal holiness? The answer is yes, it does. Now, just... Think of how the Lord Jesus Christ went to work on the commandments with the Jews, because that's what he's doing with this young man at this, this event. Take the things he mentions, or a few of them. We haven't got time to go through them all, but just let me show you how the Lord Jesus unpacks the law and takes it from externals and drives it down into the heart. We refrain from the act of adultery. Jesus said to the man, you know the law, the commandments, do not commit adultery. Now, Brethren, there may be some of us here who have committed adultery. I don't know. But many of us here, I, think, I suspect, would say, no, I've not committed adultery. I've never been unfaithful to my wife. I've never had sexual relations with another man as a wife or another woman as a husband. I have not committed adultery. But what does the Lord Jesus say? Turn your Bible with me for a moment to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 27 and 28. 
I tell you, the Lord Jesus was a teacher that would have made us all pretty, uh, pretty uh, aware of our need for something more than ourselves. Listen to this. You have heard that it was said by them of old time. That's verse 27 of chapter 5. That's, you know, he's talking about the Jews and their, and their laws and commandments, the Talmud and all the external rules. You have heard it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, now listen to this, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery already with her in his heart. Now that's something, isn't it? We don't commit adultery, but do we ever entertain lustful thoughts in our hearts? Has anyone here has flirted with someone over the internet, on your emails or whatever social media thing that you've got? Ever flirted with someone on the internet? Ever taken a sneak peek at the porn on the internet? We're okay with that. We have not committed adultery. Not according to Jesus. In fact, if you follow the law of the seventh commandment, because that's the seventh commandment, if you follow it down, it will actually prove that we're all adulterers in our heart. I am. And I wouldn't mind betting you are too. But the next commandment he, he, he refers to is murder. Uh, thou shalt not kill. Uh, let's see what Jesus has to say about that. It's in chapter 5, verse 21 through 22. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Well, that's right. But, says Jesus, I say unto you, and whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. That's murder. That's what Jesus is saying. That's murder in the heart. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Now that's attitude that comes to expression in words. We look at another human being and we say, you're just a fool. You're a worthless person. I want nothing to do with you. You're, you're rubbish. And Jesus says, that is murder. In the heart. And the law goes from external to internal. And one more just to nail it home for us. We refrain from cursing our parents. The Lord Jesus says here, uh, when he's talking about the law, uh, you, you should honour your father and mother, the fifth commandment. But just have a look what he says about that in Matthew chapter 7 for a moment. And this is really, really interesting in our day and age when we think about keeping the law. Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. If, uh, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, uh, give good things to them that ask him? Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I must have the wrong voice. Yes. Where, am I, where, am I, where have I gone wrong? It's the, it's the verse that uh, where the uh, child says to their parent, Corban, let it be Corban. Hmm. Ah, well, what a, what, a, what a shame. Let me just, let me just add a little bit and then we'll, we'll, we'll do our research a little bit later. It's right around that portion there somewhere. Anyway, this is the situation. A parent, a parent is in need. Uh, but the Jews had a provision in their law that enabled them to say uh, it is korban, which means a gift. And the idea was that a, a child, a son or a daughter, uh, who had a needy parent uh, could 
could verbally commit all their wealth and their income to the kingdom of God. So they could say, uh, everything I am and everything I have, I commit to the kingdom of God to be used in his service. And there's mum and dad over there with no food and, uh, and, and nowhere to live, perhaps sick, no one to care for them. Uh, but the, the, the child has said, it's called by. Well, Jesus is saying in, the, in that section of, of the gospel that the child who says it's called by and uses external escape mechanisms to avoid caring for their parent has broken the fifth commandment. And he takes it from external down to internal and, and, and shows us uh, that it's out of the heart that the care and love and respect for a parent must rise. So, so I'm sorry I didn't have that verse, but uh, I'll look it up and make sure we've got it right next time. So those things are very clear. The Lord Jesus uh, takes the law from external and he drives it down to the internal. It is searching us for our inner life. And uh, the law is demanding from us nothing less than moral perfection that is working itself out as love and love that gives itself to do positive good to every human being we meet. In every relation, in every way, every moment. And anything less than that, as you follow the Lord Jesus' instruction of the law down, is law-breaking. And so you can see what Jesus is doing. But the problem with that is, of course, the young man says, well, Lord, I've kept this from my youth. He wasn't aware of that spiritual dimension of the law. I've kept it from my youth. And Jesus now, as the third step, drives the law down into his heart and conscience in a way he can't avoid. And, 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 and so he says to him in verse 21, one thing thou lackest. One thing thou lackest. Not as if it's the only thing. But this is the thing that's going to bring him undone. And now the Lord Jesus turns to the 10th commandment. Do you know what the 10th commandment is? Thou shalt not covet. He turns to the 10th commandment. And uh, he's saying to him, in effect, if daily bread, your essential needs is the baseline, to be discontent or to want more than God gives you is covetous. Now let me just show you how he's doing that. The 10th commandment addresses the soul in the way that all the other commandments do by implication, but this one does it directly. The Lord Jesus says to him, having beheld him and loving him, one thing thou lackest, go thy way and sell whatsoever you have and give it to the poor. Uh-oh. This boy's very rich. He's got a whole heap of stuff. If you'd said to him, if you'd said to him, thou shalt not covet, you know, his, his response in all likelihood would be to you, I don't covet. I've got plenty. I've got houses, I've got if he was in our day and age, I've got a house, I've got cars, I've got places at the beach, I've got, I've got this, I've got that. I, I don't cover it. I've got plenty. I don't need anything. I'm rich. But the Lord Jesus is going to, is going to show him that covetousness is not healed by external things. Covetousness is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the attitude towards things. And so the Lord Jesus says to him, okay, you, you, you think you've got the law covered? Go and sell all that you have. And that brings the boy completely undone. What? Sell all that I have? I can't do that. That's not reasonable. Now, brethren, that's not as if the Lord Jesus requires every human being to sell all that they have and give it to the poor and take up their cross and follow him in exactly this way. But what the Lord Jesus is saying to him 
and showing him is that in the depths of his heart, he's a lover of money. He's a lover of possessions and he's a lover of possessions more than he is a lover of God and more than he is a lover of the inheritance itself. He is not able to bring himself to sell all that he has and he is not willing to do it. He doesn't even want to do it. And the Lord Jesus is exposing to him his value system and the way he's structured in his own soul. He is a radically covetous person and it breaks in on his soul. And he realizes that even though he thought he had kept the law and all these externals and he could, he could have a sense of, of accomplishment and, 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 and pride, now it's all struck down. It comes crashing down around him like a pack of cards. Because if he's broken the law in one point, if his heart is covetous and he will not part with his possessions for the kingdom of heaven, then he's also broken the law in every point, as the Apostle James writes in his book, chapter 2, verse 10. If we keep the whole law and offend in one point, we are guilty of all. This whole pack of cards comes just crashing down on his head. Now go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. And you shall have treasure in the kingdom of heaven. Take up your cross and follow me. It's wonderful. The Lord Jesus uh, looks at this young man. He loves him. And he calls him to, to the gospel. Through the gospel. As, he, as he's breaking and crushing him under a sense of his sin, he holds before him the gospel. Take up your cross and follow me. Sell it all. Sell it all. Let it all go. Uh, acknowledge that as a sinner, uh, you're, you're a lawbreaker. Come, take up your cross and follow me. So the young man is, is confronted with that awesome, awesome reality. I'm not good. I do not keep God's law. I cannot be saved by my good works. But I am not willing to part with my possessions. I am a covetous man and, I, and I'm not willing to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and, and he goes away sad. A sobered soul. Now that's, that's the sobering up. The young, that young man and we with him must now reckon with the corruption of our own heart. He realises now that the standard of holiness that he'd set for himself was not the true standard. He re realizes also he's unwilling to repent and forsake his sins and follow the Lord. In other words, this young man is confronted with his utter inability to save himself. That's Jesus dealing faithfully with the man. That's the Lord Jesus showing him the actual spiritual reality. And we're told that he loved them. He looked at him and he loved him. And the word that's used there is the, is the strongest word in the scripture, agape. It's the love wherewith one binds himself to another, gives himself to another and does good to that person. And, uh, I have no doubt personally that the Lord Jesus loved this man and, and he'd just begun a work in his life and soul. We don't hear any more about this young man. He may have been one of the many who was converted and gathered under the apostolic ministry later. We don't know when or how, but I have no doubt that he was converted. But this was the beginning of it. Jesus loved him. Jesus loved him. And those for, that Jesus loves, he, he, he went to the cross and paid the penalty for their sin. Those that Jesus loved, he kept the law for. Those that Jesus loved, he, he fulfills all righteousness for by his own obedience in keeping the law and dying on the cross to pay for their sin. He is the Lord, our righteousness. 
He is the end of the law for righteousness. He's the one who, when we forsake all our own works and, and unrighteousness and our filthy rags, that we, 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 we come to him by faith and lay hold of him by faith, which is a gift of God. And, and then we receive all that righteousness ours imputed to us, received through faith, and we are right with God. He's the one who is the only foundation for acceptance with God. He is the one in whom and through whom there is an inheritance in glory. And he loved this young man enough to break him down so that he would not say any longer, I'm good. He did not say any longer, I've kept the commandment. But that he'd go away sad and that he'd repent of his sins and come in as a repentant sinner, to take up his cross and to follow the Lord Jesus. Because nothing but a, a separation from the dominion of sin and its, and its lies and its darkness will ever separate someone and bring them in as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's such an important thing. And, and so I, I'd encourage you this morning, brethren, Ask yourself the question, if the Lord Jesus uh, was to say to you, in order to inherit eternal life, you've got to do, so deal with your covetousness that you, 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 you just sell all that you've got and give it to the poor, would you do it? Well, that wouldn't even deal with the covetousness itself, would it? There'd still be the resentment. There'd still be the nagging sort of sense of having lost something. We, we just can't. We won't. We sin. We need that son. So when you think of this young man going away sad, don't, don't go away sad to die. Acknowledge your complete need of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again today, or for the first time, Cast yourself on him and hear him say to you, come, follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for that we can turn our attention for a few moments to this portion of your word. Lord, we, we thank you that in your own way, in our lives, uh, for many of us at least, uh, you have actually brought us through this process to the place where we acknowledge a complete dependence on your grace and we turn for salvation to another, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so, Lord, we thank you for that work of grace. It's, it's not all full of, of skipping and, and laughing. It's also got that heartbreaking and, uh, and humbling and, uh, and often crushing work where we brought uh, to let go of ourselves and trust in ourselves to begin to trust uh, in Jesus Christ again. So continue, Lord, to work in our hearts this way. Show us our sin. But be merciful, Lord. Don't show us all at once. We couldn't sustain it. We couldn't bear it. But show us, Lord, enough so that we are indeed brought personally into trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. But let go of the covenant of work and come in under the covenant of grace to be saved by Christ alone and through faith alone and by grace alone. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.